Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to my session. I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Lydia Katzenberis. I'm a JavaScript engineer for Craigslist in San Francisco, and I have stickers if you want to come find me afterwards. Uh, that's my obligatory cat picture. Molly's been in all my presentations. I don't see any need to break that trend so far. When I first just submitted this talk, I named it Trick Out Your Terminal because I really liked the alliteration. Uh, and then as I was working on it, I, really, I realized I actually really wanted to name it Game of Shells because I like to make <laughs> relevant cultural references. Uh, but then in the end, all I could think about was the shell game. Apparently, pretty, cats are pretty good at playing it. So <laughs> <laughs> who knew? Uh, the goals for my talk are twofold. First, I want to give beginners to the terminal a sense of what it's like to work with the command line and of the power behind the cursor. Even if you don't remember everything right away, uh, it hopefully will be a handle for you to be able to like, remember as you explore and research further. So you'll uh, have seen some things before and, and feel like, oh, OK, I, re I remember that. Secondly, I want to give everyone, uh, beginners through experts, an idea of the sorts of customizations that you can do with the command line to make it more con communicative and to really make it your own. I'm going to start with some history of computer interfaces and then start talking about three different shells, uh, which are different programs for issuing text, text commands, and then walk through some different usages of each. There's a lot of information, even more that I couldn't actually fit into my presentation. Uh, so I'm, I hope that it's, it's just enough, and I will be sure to post my slides, my notes, my sources uh, online. And you can also always ask me for more information later. I'll try to answer your questions as best as I can. So before I dive in, I want to explain my motivations for starting with the history of the development of computer interaction. Engineers didn't set out to make opaque and frustrating in interfaces from the start. These things evolved out of technological constraints of the times, which included extremely limited computer speed and power. Those original <coughs> machines, they were huge, they were expensive, they were centralized, and access to them was strictly controlled. They were far less powerful than any smartphone we might carry around with us today. If you look at the command line and you think, this is not my beautiful desktop, these are not my beautiful programs, then understanding how people interacted with those first machines might help contextualize the reason for these sh terse short commands and the limited interface. So how did we get here? I'm going to skip the ancient days of vacuum tube computing and jump into computers in the 50s, the 1950s and 1960s, when the way that engineers wrote code was on punch cards. Back in the day, before widespread personal computing, computers were big centralized machines. Here you can see someone sitting at the console of an IBM 7094. You can see the punch card reader right to the right of his desk. Uh, along the left-hand wall are cabinets just for memory. They're just full of core memory, which is just totally wild. Uh, drives and disks and control units uh, are in the center, and they fill the room behind. That punch card reader, though, is where engineers would load in their stacks of uh, punch cards that represented their programs. To program with punch cards, engineers wrote out their programs on special forms and translated them into punch cards. That machine right there is a specialized typewriter for creating the punch cards. And that's a slightly mangled punch card that you can see. Uh, these cards were sorted into stacks and then they would be, uh, and then in order to run the program, you would load it into that reader, computer would uh, read in the program and then results would be printed out later. In a book on Unix usability, Eric Raymond and Rob Landley wrote that users had to accommodate computers rather than the other way around. User interfaces were considered overhead, and software was designed to keep the processor at maximum utilization with as little overhead as possible. The turnaround time for a single job often spanned entire days. Days are a long time to go uh, to just get your program at the end, find out you had an error, and you had only forgotten a semicolon. In a day and age where user interface, UI, UX, and design are all highly valued and discussed, the fact that computing power was limited to the point of considering user interfaces overhead is just completely foreign to us today. 
To move on from punch cards, there were several innovations that were key to the evolution of computer interfaces. First, batch monitors were these programs that were developed to run on computers constantly and be available to provide services to the programs as they were executed. They could also do better error reporting and give better messaging when errors occurred. And then teleprinters were hooked up to these batch monitor systems. Teleprinters were like electronic typewriters crossed with telegrams. They'd been around since the early 20th century, and they were originally used to communicate human to human. So one person would sit at their, their teleprinter uh, any amount of distance away, another person would sit at theirs, and they could type messages to each other like some arcane, old-fashioned text messaging. With the advent of batch monitor programs, a teleprinter could be used to issue commands to a computer and to receive output in turn. They were still kind of clunky and inefficient, not to mention all that paper waste just printing out commands. But it was much quicker than punch cards, and now people could receive feedback in almost real time. Finally, video displays replaced these teleprinters in the mid-70s. This actually looks kind of familiar, uh, like, many, like what many of us would identify as a computer today. But even though it looks a lot like a computer, it isn't actually one. This is a picture of something called a terminal. If you disconnected it and you moved it anywhere else, it wouldn't be able to do anything because it didn't have hard drives, memory, processors. This was simply an interface to the actual computer itself. To use a computer, you had to go sit at one of these terminals, type in your commands, and then receive the output on that display. And that's basically the invention of the command line we know and love today, uh, eluding some other really interesting bits. Compared to punch cards and teleprinters, they're way faster. You get immediate feedback, and you can even change things on the fly in response to the output you get. Super cool. But there is a trade-off. Raymond and Lanley again note that these interfaces still placed a relatively high mnemonic load on the user, requiring a serious investment of effort and learning time to master. That's still pretty true today. The graphical user interface that we're all familiar with was developed as an alternative to the command line interface. It was a reaction to the steep learning curve perceived around the command line. When you use a GUI, you directly interact with the graphical representations of files and actions. These interfaces were enabled by video displays and input, mouse, input, input devices like the mouse. But the command line came first. It was a terse interface for a more technologically limited time. With the rise of personal computing, we now have interfaces directly attached to our computers, like a laptop. Terminals still exist, but they aren't physical pieces of hardware anymore. They're now programs that live inside the GUI, emulating the same sort of experience as older physical terminals. The command line program for Mac OS is even called Terminal. On Windows, a similar terminal emulator program is called the command prompt. So if we have <laughs> perfectly serviceable graphical interfaces in the modern era, why should we learn something somewhat arcane and kind of unapproachable like the command line? Eric Raymond, in The Art of Unix Programming, particularly takes pains to note that the command line really shines when novice or casual users become more adept and they want to perform more skilled tasks with computers. Automation is your friend, and it can be a lot easier to write on the command line. Tasks like enumeration or find and replace tasks, Gesundheit, which can be kind of tedious, uh, they can become an interesting challenge when you can write a program to do it for you. For example, if you wanted to install a new application, you could install it by hand and keep track of the things that it needs uh, yourself, or you could use a package manager like Homebrew for Mac OS to install, manage dependencies, update things, and uninstall things for you with just a few commands. But I also want to make the point that we don't have to take the command line as is. Even though there are some really good reasons for why the command line is the way that it is, it can also still be better. It's terse to the point of being wholly unintelligible. We spend a lot of time with our tools. And the command line doesn't have to be a hostile or unaccommodating environment. It just takes a little more effort and a little more learning to make it friendly and expressive. For example, I just recently, di uh, recently discovered my friend's Vim configuration. 
Vim is a text editor that you can access from the command line. I've been mistaking it for some time as Sublime Text, uh, which is a desktop GUI app that I personally use for most of my own coding. If I'd known that Vim could look like this, I might have invested more time in learning it by now. Personally, I think that it's not good enough to be efficient. I also want to be comfortable with the stuff that I work with. I want to open a window and go, ah, this is a place that I actually want to build things. I asked people on Twitter to send me their terminal customizations. And I got some really amazing responses. Uh, this one's from Jessica Lord, and it's so clean and zen-like. It's just really relaxing. There's a, another engineer called, uh, named Randall Gordon, and he sent me a screenshot of his prompt, which is super complex, but really informative. Like, for him, he knows everything that's going on there. There's a lot to learn on the command line, uh, from everyday usage to tricking it out with the file path, git status, username, and emoji, like Jen Schiffer did. So let's get started talking about some shells. So I've been talking a lot about terminals and command lines. So now what the heck are shells? These terms are often used rather interchangeably. The terminal, as you remember, is that physical device that people used to interface, interface with computers back in the day. Nowadays, it's the program that we use to emulate that old school interface. The command line interpreter is, or the shell, uh, either or, is the application that runs inside the terminal itself. Uh, so now you can just open up a terminal on your desktop, and the shell is waiting inside uh, to receive your input and output uh, results. One of the most common shells out there is called Bash. Uh, so let's, see. do you mind waiting until the end? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's take some first steps with Bash. Uh, I had some more history of the development of shells here, but I've edited it out in the interest of time. Uh, for now, I just want to note that uh, Bash was created by an engineer named Brian Fox in 1989, when he was working for Richard Stallman's Free Software Foundation. Bash inherits a lot of characteristics from earlier shells, like the Born shell, C shell, the Corn shell, and even the original S.H. Thompson, Thompson shell that was shipped with the first version of Unix. Bash was shipped with Unix version 7. <coughs> Before I start showing you commands, I just want to emphasize that it's well worth the time that it takes to understand commands really thoroughly before you just enter them into your shell. You really actually can tell your computer to do things like delete your entire home directory with just a few characters, and malicious pranksters, a.k.a. trolls, might try to trick a newbie with harmful commands. You should never copy and paste a command from the internet without understanding precisely what it does. Additionally, you should, uh, some sites will like give you a quick command and URL to just download and execute things. So you should make sure you only are downloading things from sources that you trust. Fortunately, there is onboard documentation for every command right in the shell. If you want to read documentation for a command, you can type man, short for manual, followed by a space, followed by the command uh, name. This is sample output for the echo command. You can also Google commands for help. I do that a lot as well, since the documentation inside the man command can be kind of dry or dense, difficult to parse. So uh, let's see what it's like to work, uh, to work in Bash. Um, I'm going to try to live code, because why not? Uh, can every, everyone can see that, it's pretty big, right? We're good? All right, cool. So starting off, this particular default implementation of Bash shows the shell that we're using, which is Bash, and the version of Bash running, 3.2. The dollar sign starts the area where we can type, and this whole string of things is called the prompt. We can type whatever we want after the prompt. If it's not a valid command, Bash will give us an error. It doesn't know what command that is, command not found. Uh, we can see where we are on the computer by uh, typing the command pwd and pressing enter. That, it looks like my home directory. We can change directories by using the command cd. So I'm gonna cd into the folder or the directory, it's the same sort of same thing uh, for the 
uh, I'm gonna change into the folder that I've been using to develop this talk. So I can go into Dropbox, OS Bridge. The nice thing is that uh, Bash is smart enough to autocomplete things for you as you're typing, or as you type and then hit tab. If you are starting a valid folder name and hit tab, it will autocomplete it for you and save you a few keystrokes. Also, the tilde character is short for your home directory. So I don't have to type slash user slash Lydia slash Dropbox slash OS bridge every single time. If once I execute that command, I can use the list command ls and list everything in there. So I have a whole bunch of movies and GIFs that I use to make my talk. I can also use the list command, clear that and bring it to the talk. I can use the list command to uh, look at inside what's inside a folder without actually changing directories into it. So I have, a, I have a pics folder that I had been using to keep all my images for this talk. And I can do the same thing, list out all the things that are in there, and uh, that's pretty easy. Uh, so if I want to make a new folder, I can use the command mkdir, make directory, I guess, and do a new one, make dir demo. Uh, if we ls again, and maybe scroll up a bit, there we are, demo. And you can cd into demo. It's an empty folder. You can also make files by saying touch example.txt, and that just makes an empty new file. Listing again shows that we've successfully created a file. Pretty cool. Uh, I use the command clear to clear my current console and bring it all up to the top. I'm just doing that so that brings it back to the top and you can see it a little bit easier. Uh, and that's, that's kind of good for now. So that's just uh, a little bit of uh, changing directories, looking at files, and making some new things. So something you might notice is that many of these commands are abbreviations or acronyms. There are lots and lots of commands. Most of them have little shorthand names. Many are tiny applications that let you do things like read files, edit files, log into servers. There are also a lot of symbols, uh, some of which are familiar from programming if you know how to code, and some are not. And this is just a small sample of all the commands that are out there. But don't panic. These things do take some time to learn, and much like <coughs> learning a new language, either a foreign language or programming language, uh, getting that vocabulary down gets easier with practice, and you just get better at it the more you do it. And finally, some fun bits. Uh, customization. Bash configures its prompt by using the PS1 and the PS2 environment variables. Environment variables are system properties that the shell keeps track of. PS1 defines the primary prompt that you see. And we can type experiments with the prompt right inside the terminal by assigning, the characters, uh, by assigning characters to the PS1 prompt. So let's give that a shot. I'll come back to bash. Oh wait, first I'm going to advance my slides so I see notes. And then, all right. Uh, the first thing I can do is just type P, capital P, capital S, number one, followed by an equal sign, and then I'm going to start a string, single or double, doesn't matter, uh, and I'm just going to do a simple smiley face and have a space and then close the string. The space is just so that it's easier to understand what we are outputting, or what we're typing next to, uh, well, okay, you'll see. So now the prompt is a smiley face. It's cute. Uh, I like it. It's very cheerful. But we could make it a little more useful, maybe, as well as friendly. Uh, Bash has special shorthand characters called escape sequences, and those are a lot like environment variables. You can see them all um, and a whole lot more if you type uh, man bash to read the documentation on Bash. Uh, so I'm going to insert some of those escape characters. First, I'm going to 
<coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to use the up arrow to tab back to the history of the commands that I've already written. So then I can just edit, whoops, edit that uh, command that is already there. Uh, if I insert, I'm going to tab backwards a little bit. Actually, I'll just delete that whole thing. Uh, if we type the escape sequence backslash u, we're going to get my current username or your current username if you are typing it yourself. Uh, and then uh, we can also see the host name, so whatever my computer is currently named on the network by typing slash h. And I'm going to separate them with an at sign, kind of like an email address. Uh, and then finally, uh, I want to see what directory I am currently living in or working in. Uh, so I'm going to separate things again with a colon and then type the escape sequence backslash w <coughs> for the current directory, which is uh, the same thing that would be output by the command pwd if you were to type that every single time, I guess. Um, and then, I don't know, maybe it's time for an emoji. Uh, does anyone have a favorite emoji? Snowman. Snowman. Yeah. Snow. Here he is. Where's my mouse? There he is. Snowman. Oh. Oh, he's so small. I guess, uh, I guess the snowmen don't uh, scale very well in the terminal. But if, if it, I mean, this is like 60 point font right now. So. <laughs> If you uh, if it's normal, then you'll probably it'll be better sized for that. But now we have a cheerful little snowman, and I always know who I'm logged in as, where I am, and uh, where what folder I'm currently uh, located in. So that's kind of cool. Uh, go back to my thing, advance it. So right now the problem with this entire setup is that. <coughs> If I open a new bash session, it's going to revert to that old prompt. So I'll just show you that. Yep, nope, it's, it's the old one again. What if we want to make our changes permanent? To make our prompt changes permanent, we have to save this PS1 variable inside a configuration file called uh, whoops, .bashrc. <coughs> this is the file that bash reads when it starts up to understand what to do and to read settings. Um, it looks like that. That's the file name. It's usually invisible on your computer because it uh, starts with that dot. And uh, since those are usually configuration files, your computer will uh, keep them invisible by default. But fortunately, we can use a command, ls again, but with a, a flag or a switch on it to tell it to show everything. I, I guess I, I think of the capital A as all. Show me all. And then uh, your bash RC file will live in your home directory. So if you run uh, ls dash capital A tilde, you can see all of my config files. And the dot bash RC is right there. You might not have one yet. So if you don't have one, you can just make it. And that's, that's totally cool as well. Uh, and then finally, there is a bit of a, a gotcha with Mac OS. Uh, it likes to be special and, not, and handle things differently. So you may end up having to uh, edit a file called bash, or dot bash underscore score profile or dot bash, or excuse me, or dot profile. Uh, I found a pretty good article on uh, figuring that out. Um, can link that in my slides later. And then finally, uh, you will want to actually edit this file. You could do it in, say, like text editor, your your favorite plain text editor. <clears throat> but in the command line, there are also some onboard text editors as well. Uh, at least one of these, if not all of them, will probably be installed on most of the shells that you use already. The two biggest ones are Vim and Emacs. They're uh, powerful, they're complex, and they're almost infinitely customizable. 
people are also really, really passionate about them. So it's a good way to start a nerd war by asking someone what they prefer and why the other one is terrible. <laughs> but at the end of the day, they edit text. So <laughs> there are also smaller editors, smaller like Nano and Pico that are less powerful. They have fewer configura configuration options. Uh, and so they might be a little more approachable. So you might want to begin exploring with them. I actually stuck with Nano for a really long time. I've only started exploring with Vim in the past year. And I can basically like use arrow keys to scroll around and save things. And that's, that's pretty good, but hey, it's a start. Uh, so let's edit that bash RC so that we actually save things. I'm going to close that tab. <coughs> To, uh, oh, first I want to copy this so that I have it. And then to open Vim and to open the bash RC file, I'm going to type Vim, V-I-M, space, <coughs> tilde, slash, not dot, dot, <laughs> bash RC. Uh, so that opened it up. and. I spoiled the surprise because I'd already been in here doing stuff. I'll just delete that one. Put the new one in with the snowman. Uh, to edit stuff, I had to press the I key first. You can't just type things in Vim. You have to go into edit mode first, uh, and that's I. Uh, to get out of edit mode, I hit escape, and to save, I, of course, naturally, as we all know, hit colon WQ for save. Uh, I guess it, it stands for write, so that saves the file and then quit exits the program. So now we should be good to go. If I open a new bash session, yes, we successfully see the new prompt. Awesome. <coughs> there is a of course, a whole lot more to do with your bash prompt. And there are a lot of tutorials out there to tell you how to do that. But I just wanted to give you a basic idea of what the, the process is like. I just also wanted to move on to two other shells that I wanted to introduce you to today. Uh, but most of the things that we've gone through with bash will be applicable with uh, ZSH especially, and then uh, for the most part with fish as well. If you want to get going with Bash, though, uh, since it's really common and probably already installed in your computer, <coughs> this DigitalOcean article, How to Customize Your Bash Prompt on a Linux VPS uh, by Justin Ellingwood, has some Linux-specific stuff at the beginning. But the later information on customizing Bash is very general and, and really approachable and well-written. And it gets into adding color to your bash prompt, which is really helpful as well. So then let's talk about ZSH. Uh, ZSH is another shell that's out there. Um, to install it, you can find the installation instructions at zsh.org. Uh, it also was just uh, already installed on my Mac, so that was kind of cool too. Switching from, ZS, or from Bash into ZSH is as easy as typing ZSH at the terminal. But you may, have to set, uh, you may have to run a configuration command in order to make it your default shell. <coughs> uh, why would you use ZSH instead of Bash? ZSH is actually a superset of Bash. So 99% of what you can do in Bash, you can do in ZSH, uh, plus all that and more. It's like an evolution of Bash. For example, uh, ZSH has some really cool tab completions that if you type CD <coughs> excuse me, and press tab, ZSH will show you the valid directories that you can type next and go uh, from there. So trying to help you uh, remember what the path looks like. Additionally, uh, in Bash, uh, like I showed before, if you press the up key, you can see the previous commands you've already run. Uh, in ZSH, you can actually type at the beginning or type out a command that you've used before. And then uh, press the up key, and you will see the different uh, options or flags that you've run with that command before. 
Uh, so it's a really easy way to uh, kind of look for stuff you've already done. If you can't remember, like, oh, what was that flag that I used? Uh, what uh, host URL did I log into to get into that server? You can just uh, type in the command really quick and then auto-complete it. But maybe the most uh, compelling feature of ZSH is, oh, not that, not backwards, forwards, uh, is the framework that people have, that um, Robbie Russell has uh, created around uh, the settings and themes for ZSH. This is a really actually like uh, vibrant little project. Like people, it's very active on GitHub. There's a ton of contributors. Uh, it even has stickers and t-shirts if that's any indication of its popularity. And it's just like an easier way of managing all of these settings for you. Installing it is pretty easy. <clears throat> on their homepage they have a command that you can copy and download and execute. Uh, like I said before, you should be very wary of sites that just say that, but I, I do trust that site. Um, but you can take that with a grain of salt because you should be skeptical about stuff you download to your computer. Uh, but uh, it does walk you through uh, a few things, like it will it'll set ZSH as your shell, as your uh, default shell for you, and then Customizing ZSH with Oh My ZSH uh, is much like uh, editing the bash RC, but instead the file is called ZSH RC. And when you have downloaded the Oh My ZSH framework, it'll already have uh, a settings file written all out for you. And you can just find the variables you want to change and uh, just follow the instructions on the website. There are a ton of themes. There are um, a ton of plugins that they have for different languages, syntaxes, uh, version control like Git, all sorts of stuff. Um, and it's a very powerful uh, shell. So if you want to upgrade your Bash experience, ZSH is a great way to do that. But what I actually really, really wanted to come here today to talk about was Fish, the friendly shell. Uh, Fish is finally a command line for the 90s. Um, but don't let that, that kind of adorable text put you off. Like ZSH uh, and, oh my ZSH, Fish is under active development on GitHub. It has installers for a ton of major platforms. If you're using Homebrew on Mac OS, just brew install Fish from your terminal and you're good to go. Uh, they also have packages for a bunch of different flavors for Linux and uh, for Sigwin, which is a Unix-like emulator for the command line on Windows as well. It's all on the homepage at fishshell.com. Uh, Fish aims to be helpful and expressive right out of the box. It has colors right away. Uh, <clears throat> it remembers your command line history so that if you've painstakingly typed in a very long command before, it'll remember it and suggest it to you for the next time. It's much like ZSH, but it actually does this right as you type. I have a GIF a little later on that you can see. It also does a cool thing with uh, man page completions. So if you type a command, <coughs> excuse me, like grep or ls or scp, anything with a bunch of switches that are hard to remember, you can type the command and then dash and then hit the tab key and it'll give you a little tiny summary of each flag right for your reference so you don't have to go into the man command uh, view. Uh, using fish, it's, for me, it, it's, it has these very active auto completions and it's actually one of the most powerful things I would argue about it. Uh, you might be taken aback at first by all this text kind of flashing at you as you build a command, but this sort of real-time feedback has been really invaluable to me uh, becoming more comfortable on the command line. As you can see there, uh, commands are red until they are valid commands, and then they turn blue. And just having that very simple detail is really, really good feedback. Uh, so I know not to press enter and type something that doesn't exist. It, lets you know when it's ready 
and a valid thing to do. You can also tab to complete the suggestions part way. You can tab to see valid places in folders. It just really tries to give you as much information as possible. ZSH has also a lot of the same features, but they're not as real time. Uh, so this real time feedback is what really makes it very compelling for me. Additionally, customizing fish, ha uh, it has a cool interactive way to customize your themes. If you run the fish, com fish config command after installing right from your terminal, it'll open this little web app and you'll be able to interact with this web app and set all your stuff uh, in a, uh, I don't know, just a more aesthetically pleasing and slightly easier way. So, sorry? In a GUI. <laughs> And uh, yeah, well, if you're just starting out, it's, it's, it can be intimidating with all the different variables that you can set, all the different things you can do. Um, and this is also a great place to get a, a sense of what fish can do, and you can use these commands that are present in here to build your own. And once you're more comfortable with uh, editing things on the command line, uh, you'll just already have a sense of what, what is available to you. If you're looking for more managed solutions to customizing fish, there are some frameworks out there. Uh, oh My Fish, I guess, uh, is deriving from Oh My ZSH. Um, there are a few gotchas with fish. Uh, Bash and ZSH have these clear legacies that go back to the born shell, so they have um, very similar syntaxes. But fish took a wholly different approach, and so it has some incompatibilities with Bash and ZSH. You'll have to learn how to declare and script the fish way, and that can have a few downsides. Uh, a small example is that the sublist operator, as ZSH calls it, uh, is a, I thought, oh, okay. Uh, it's the ampersand ampersand here. So what it's doing is running the git clone command, which downloads a git repository and makes a new folder for it. And then after that's done, it CDs into that new folder. So just all in one line, you don't have to type two separate commands. Uh, that's the same in bash and ZSH. But with fish, it's actually uh, the word and, and you have to be sure to end your first command with a semicolon. That's just one small example. There are some other consistencies. For the most part, things are pretty consistent and the same, but uh, you can run into small gotchas. So uh, since Fish is not as popular as Bash, sometimes certain command line tools or open source projects, they might not have Fish support. Uh, or you might find a neat shell script that someone wrote and have to translate it so that Fish is happy. Fortunately, on Hyper Polyglot, there, is, there are tons and tons of these tables that do the translations for you, so you can look up uh, what you need to know in order to translate those uh, uh, those scripts. And this was just, I just wanted to take another gif of working with fish because there, uh, there's so many, like the auto completions are just awesome is what I'm trying to say. It's, it just is so helpful. In the end, use the tool for the job. Bash is hella customizable, it's super prevalent, ZSH is all that Bash is, plus customizability and more, and Fish tries to be helpful right out of the package. The world is your oyster shell. Uh, ha ha. Uh, next steps that I didn't have time to uh, talk about, and I really wanted to, but I didn't have time. Um, redirection and piping is like intermediate level command line stuff. Uh, this starts, this is where the command line really starts getting powerful is when you can take output from one command, put it directly into another command and keep going until you have transformed something. Uh, a coworker of mine shared this command uh, that he built with me. It parses a log file and it counts the number of files logged, uh, the, the text file names logged by extension and then outputs the uh, amount of times that uh, files of a certain extension appeared. And you can write a whole like long program or, or apparently you can do it in a uh, gr uh, shell one-liner. Uh, so that's really, really cool. And that's super powerful. So the things you uh, would look for are called redirection and pipes. And those get into the 
the uh, working with the standard in, the standard out, and the standard error, which is how uh, things talk to each other, basically. Uh, other things I want to uh, encourage you to look on GitHub. People have put a lot of their configuration files online. So if you search dot files on GitHub, it's a great place to get inspiration and uh, to also borrow some scripts. If you get inspired and you want to put your own dot files online, I just want to warn you to not put, make sure you're not putting your SSH keys or your passwords out there. Just keep that in mind. Uh, but it is a really cool uh, thing to do. Uh, fun little open source thing source things. Um, this, is, this is my shell. Like when I open a new session, I get a dog. And it has randomly generated little like, wow, very LL cats, much, you know, whatever. Uh, so that's cute. Uh, a friend of mine made moon moji. So it actually shows the current moon phase in your terminal. Uh, these are two prompts, uh, Laura DeGroote and Blake Winton. Both have moon moji in their prompts, which is super cool. There's also clock moji, uh, which is the second emoji there. Uh, shows the current time in emoji. Uh, I found a great uh, list of shell widgets curated on GitHub. And you can, of course, search for many, many more. Um, this is my really poorly formatted resources slide. And there are so many more. But I really wanted to shout out Digital Oceans documentation is particularly well written. Uh, Eric Raymond has a bunch of his writings open sourced online. So if you want to learn more about the history, development, and philosophy of Unix, uh, which is where I, I got a lot of my research from the beginning of my talk. And Jessica Dillon wrote a great series of blog posts for Quick Left uh, on beginning with the command line. Just really fantastic walkthrough of basic commands and stuff. Uh, and she recently com compiled them all into an ebook that you can get online. Uh, and I will actually update that so that you can get all of that stuff a lot easier. I really want to quickly thank some people to the organizers and volunteers of OS Bridge. Thank you. This is a really cool event. Uh, shout out to my coworkers who saw a super rough, talk, uh, rough version of this talk. They gave me invaluable feedback and sent me that awesome example of a really long piped command. Rebecca Murphy for mentoring uh, suggestions that led me to submitting this talk to Open Source Bridge. All of these great people on Twitter sent me their awesome shell prompts and dot files. Thank you very much. Uh, Alex Durgachev made this great command line movie to GIF conversion tool, which uh, I used to make all of the GIFs of the command line there and also like made examples of in the GIFs themselves. So that's a little inception for you. Uh, to all of you for attending and sticking through this talk, thank you very much. I hope you learned something. Whew. It's a command line.